We're now going to talk about how to solve a second order homogeneous linear differential equation that has constant coefficients. Constant coefficients is important. For instance, this differential equation does not have constant coefficients. This is linear because the dependent variable isn't squared, but this method will not work if I have my independent variable multiplying my dependent variables. So it needs to be in the form of a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y equals zero, where a, b, and c are all constants. Now if I want this to be a second order, I have to specify that a can't be equal to zero. So let's start with an example. So this is an IVP problem. Because this is a second order differential equation, we're going to get two solutions and we're going to have two constants. So if we're going to be able to calculate what our two constants are, we're going to need two initial conditions. So we'll have an initial condition at y and then an initial condition for y prime. What I'm going to do is say, well, what happens if we guess a certain form of solution? That is, let's say y is equal to e raised to some r times x. A lot of our solutions so far in this class have ended up having e's in it. So this is not an unreasonable place to start. If I look at y prime and y double prime, I end up with this. And now if I go ahead and plug it back into my original differential equation, I can now factor out my e to the rx. And if I remember my algebra, the only way this is true, that is something times something equals zero, is if one of the factors or both of the factors are equal to zero. Well, if I look at e to the rx, there is no number I can plug in for r that would make that zero. e to the rx gets asymptotically close to zero, but it never equals zero. So that means the only thing that can equal zero is the second factor. This is called the characteristic equation. What this is going to do is tell us what our values for r need to be in order to make my original guess true. If I factor this, I get two values of r, and if I plug that back into my original guess, I get two solutions, e to the 4x and then e to the 2x. So those are my y1s and y2s. And if we remember our superposition principle, we can add those together to give us our general solution. And it doesn't matter what order you put these in. You could have just as easily put c1 e to the 2x plus c2 e to the 4x. I won't bother proving this, but with the Ron scan, we could show that e to the 4x and e to the 2x are in fact linearly independent. Now what I could do is use my initial conditions to find my values of c. And in this first equation, I find that c1 plus c2 equal negative 2. Now if I take the first derivative of that equation, and now I look at what happens when x is equal to 0, I can go ahead and divide both sides by 2. I can solve the second equation for c2, and I can plug it back into my first equation to find c1. And I'll find that c1 is equal to 5. If c1 is equal to 5, that means c2 is equal to negative 7. And now I've been able to find my first second order differential equation. This original equation has a solution y equals 5 e to the 4x minus 7 e to the 2x. So let's summarize what we just did. What we did is we assumed this solution. Now I'm not going to each time plug in e to the rx and then go ahead and factor it out. I'm going to be able to go directly to my characteristic equation. So y double prime becomes r squared, y prime becomes r, and y becomes r to the 0, or simply 1. And of course my constants are also there. So this is a regular quadratic equation. So remembering what happened in algebra when we had a quadratic equation, we have three situations. We could end up with two real solutions. That's the example we just did. We could end up with one repeated solution, and we could come up with two imaginary solutions or two complex solutions. What tells us what kind of solutions we have is the bit under the square root sign. It's also called the discriminant. If this is positive, we have two real solutions. If it's equal to zero, then we have one repeated solution. And if it's negative, then we have two complex solutions. Let's look at a few examples. If this is my differential equation, the first thing I do is write the characteristic equation. I would factor, and when I would find my two solutions are 0 and 7. So that means y is equal to c1 e to the 0x plus c2 e to the 7x. Of course, e to the 0x is simply 1, so that would be my general solution. If instead I had an equation that looked like this, then my characteristic equation would look like this. Remember, there's no y prime, so there's no r term. In this case, r is equal to plus or minus the square root of 5. And now my general solution 
is simply this. But now let's look what happens if I have complex solutions. In this case, my characteristic equation is this, and when I use the quadratic equation, I get negative 2 plus or minus i. I have both a real component and an imaginary component. So therefore, my solution must be this. Well, I can do a little bit with this. That is, I could use my exponent rules and get the real portion out, and then I can see that both my y1 and y2 have the same real portion to it. This is because differential equations always come in complex conjugate errors, which means the real portion will always be the same. And then the complex portion will again always be the same, but one will be positive and one will be negative. So the form of solution will always be alpha plus or minus beta i, where alpha is the real portion and beta is the coefficient in front of the i. So I'm fine with the e to the negative 2x. I don't really like leaving solutions with i's in it. So what we're going to use to make this a little bit cleaner is Euler's formula. That is e to the plus or minus i theta is equal to cosine theta plus or minus i sine theta. Let's take a general complex solution. That is where y1 is equal to e to the alpha x, that's the real portion, times e to the i beta x, and y2 is e to the alpha x, as in y1, but then e to the negative i beta x for the imaginary part. And now let's try to use Euler's formula to clean this up. Then we have y1 is equal to e to the alpha x times cosine beta x plus i sine beta x, and y2 is e to the alpha x times cosine beta x minus i sine beta x. So now instead of looking at y1 and y2, I'm going to look at y3 and y4, because linear combinations of solutions are also solutions. So I'm going to make y3 y1 plus y2 divided by 2, and y4 being y1 minus y2 over 2i. And why are we going to do that? Well, let's show you. If I look at y3, I see that the i sine beta add to 0, because I have one positive and one negative, and because I have two cosine beta x, I end up, after I'm done simplifying, that y3 is simply equal to e to the alpha x cosine beta x. Now if I look at y4, I get almost the same thing, except this time the cosine is what adds to zero, and I'm left with 2i sine beta x, so if I divide that by 2i, I end up with simply e to the alpha x sine beta x. Now I have two real solutions, and they are in fact linearly independent, so I can generalize this. If I end up with two complex solutions in the form alpha plus beta i, then I know my solution is simply this. y is equal to c1 e to the alpha x cosine beta x plus c2 e to the alpha x times sine beta x. So this is something you should memorize. If I end up with two complex solutions, this will always be the form of my solution. Just as a reminder, when we had two real solutions, this was a form. Now the only thing we have to worry about is what happens if we get a repeated solution. If we have a differential equation such as this, what would happen if we took the characteristic equation and factored it? We would find that we had a solution of r equals 8. But that just gives us y1. We need a second solution. So what I'm going to tell you is, if we have a repeated root, then the general solution is c1 e to the rx plus c2 times x times e to the rx. That is, we're going to throw in an extra independent variable. Let's double check to make sure these are in fact linearly independent. When I take the Ronsky in, and we find that this is equal to, which is not equal to zero. So those are our three cases. If we have a linear homogeneous second order differential equation with constant coefficients, these are our only three types of solutions. Two real, two complex, and one repeated. Please have these memorized for the exam.